<laughs> Why exactly is Deco dressed as a pirate? I don't know. I thought Saturdays were Batman Day. Welcome to the fourth installment of Jackass Side Projects and Cameos. Starting off with two different episodes of the incredible Mike Judge animated series King of the Hill, with special guest appearances by the one and only Johnny Knoxville. At Earth Cleaners, we only do one thing, but we do it so sweet. We pick up poo. In Season 10, Episode 8, Hank Hill's son, Bobby, participates in his school's job shadow program and gets paired up with the Johnny Knoxville voiced character named Peter Sterling, owner and operator of Earth Cleaners, a company that specializes in picking shit up, literally. Even though he's initially reluctant about Peter's occupation, Bobby ends up loving it, especially after realizing that Peter has made a crap load of money in his profession. But Hank doesn't want his son to follow the same path, so Peter is forced to convince Bobby not to pursue a career in poop and puke removal. In an amazing nod to the poo cocktail stunt from the first episode of Jack Butt, Peter pays a bunch of frat boys to shove him into a porta potty and roll him down a hill. He claims that this has happened before and it's a common occurrence in his line of work. Seeing this, Bobby is convinced to reconsider his career as a pooper scooper, or a poop sucker. This episode aired just a few months before the release of Jackass No. 2, which, as you may recall, featured an appearance by Mike Judge himself. But Mike would bring Knoxville back for a different role on King of the Hill for Season 12, Episode 22, where he portrayed the character of Hoyt Platter. As the older brother of Peggy and the father of Luann, this character was long referenced in the series, but this was his very first appearance on the show. King of the Hill is currently slated for a revival, and I really hope that Knoxville is brought back for the voice acting cast, because he fits in so well on the show. You might remember that in the last episode of this series, we took a look at the Academy Award winning classic known as Shred starring Dave England. Well, it turns out that immediately after wrapping production on that movie, they turned around and made its sequel, Shred 2, Revenge of the Boarding School Dropouts. You think we call Shred 2, right? Shred, yeah. And then the, the sequel came out and they called it, I'm going to see if I can even remember it, The Revenge of the Boarding School Dropouts. <laughs> I was like, what? it didn't even make sense at all. I wasn't like, what happens in the movie. In all seriousness, the original Shred might as well have been a masterpiece compared to the second installment because, oh my god, it is atrocious. And I don't feel bad saying that because even Dave himself has not been shy about crapping all over these movies. And I, and I mean, the movies suck, but like, I actually felt like I was acting. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Like well, I said, I was just playing a watch of Snow. Yeah, I'll have so. to go watch that, man. No, you won't. <laughs> yeah. You won't have to. <laughs> And when I said that they turned around and made the sequel to Shred, I wasn't exaggerating. These movies were filmed back to back in a span of just five weeks. And the film's plot can be summarized in like two seconds. Basically, Max and Eddie's snowboard camp that they established in the first film is popping off. The models and the bottles that they dreamed about in the first movie have come to fruition, and their team's best rider, Chris, is quickly gaining notoriety in the sport. But Kingsley, played by Tom Green, wants him to ride for his new team. Chris begins shacking up with the girl who played McTitty in Good Luck Chuck, who, surprise, surprise, was hired by Kingsley to coerce him into leaving Max and Eddie's team. And that's basically the entire movie. But I seriously laughed maybe two times during the entirety of Shred 2, and only because of Dave England. I'm gonna punch you in the lyrics! I'm gonna stab you in the red Oh, hey, baby. How was your trip? Give me a kiss. Oh, and I definitely laughed at the security guard's insane haircut. But I truly believe that this sequel wasn't even planned until production began on the first movie, because it just feels kind of slapped together. That being said, Johnny Tsunami is still the king of the snowboarding movie subgenre. I don't make the rules, I'm just stating a fact. Less than three weeks after the series finale of Workaholics aired, the cast began filming on the movie Game Over Man. In the film, the guys play three college dropouts working as housekeepers at a hotel, who, in their spare time, are working on a video game controller called the Skintendo Joy Suit. Nintendo has one of the hardest working legal teams in the business, so I'm seriously shocked that the production company for this movie didn't get sued for that. Anyway, the hotel gets overrun by terrorists, and the trio is forced to face off against them. A bunch of celebrities made cameos in this movie, including Steve-O, who, in his scene, thinks that the terrorist takeover is a prank orchestrated by Johnny Knoxville. This scene was funny enough by itself, but later on in the movie, Chris Pontius is seen mourning the loss of his best friend, attempting to communicate with him in the spirit world. Steve-O, if you can hear me in the spirit world, I love you, brother. Should've been you. Should've been you. 
You. The Workaholics crew has been pretty candid about the influence that Jackass and CKY had on their careers. Adam has appeared on Steve-O's podcast, Kyle made an appearance on Chris Rav's podcast, and a few Jack butt. references were made on the show as well. Okay, no, that is hippie crack, man. Did we not all cry during that Steve-O documentary? Surprisingly, none of the Jack butt crew members ever made appearances on Workaholics, with exception to Eddie Barbanel, who made a quick appearance in Jack butt 3D and played Bradley, aka B-Rad, in one of my favorite episodes of the show. We thought you were taking us to your house. Yeah, my house of pancakes. A Workaholics movie is currently in the works, and I really hope that someone from the Jackass crew is able to appear in the film. Or they could just bring back B-Rad, I'd be fine with that. So it turns out that literally right after I finished editing this section of the video, Paramount Plus announced the cancellation of the Workaholics movie. And as a longtime fan of Workaholics, I'm really disappointed. But as a dedicated listener of the guy's podcast and a member of the Arugaloids, I'm pissed, I'm pissed now! now. Hopefully another streaming network picks the movie up. I'm sure that news of that will drop right after I edit this part of the video, but we'll just have to wait and see, I guess. All right, enjoy the rest of the video. The Jack Butt. cast makes a lot of cameo appearances, some of which aren't long enough to dedicate an entire section of a video to. So before we get to the final topic of today's video, we're gonna do a bit of a lightning round where we take a look at multiple projects. Starting with Brandon DiCamillo's Blink and You'll Miss It background appearance in the incredible Darren Aronofsky directed film, The Wrestler. If you look closely during the hardcore match scene, you can see and hear Deco screaming like a maniac in the crowd. And for the diehard CKY fans, you can also pick out Lendon, also known as Lunchtime Lendon, standing right next to him. On a sort of related note, I saw that Bam Margera had a credit on his IMDb page for a 2005 WWE Raw episode, and I had to find a way to include it in this video. Shout out to friend of the show Uncle Unbaited for helping me find the episode, because you can clearly see Bam in the crowd alongside Nick Hogan, attempting to dodge the absolute absolute madness going on after Matt Hardy attacked Edge. He jumped, they, they, the cops throw him over where I am, it lands on me, I fall back in my chair, and then their cameras are all over and it's live, and I'm just like, holy <laughs> like, I, I wasn't supposed to fall back in my chair, what the hell's going on? And I guess this lightning round is just wrestling theme because this next movie stars the late Luke Perry, whose son Jack performs under the name Jungle Boy in the AEW. Anyway, in the movie Dish Dogs, sorry, Dish Dogs, with a Z, the mid-2000s were so extreme. The main protagonist of the film takes a dishwashing position at an extreme sports camp after the previous dishwasher is fired. That fired dishwasher was played by the one and only Danger Aaron, who was almost 30 years old during the filming of this, but was credited as Fired Dish Boy. What? And for the final topic of today's video, let's take a look at the Bam Margera cartoon that never was, Bamimation. Co-developed by MTV Animation and Six Point Harness in 2006, Bamimation attempted to capitalize on the massive popularity of Viva La Bam, which had just concluded after five seasons. The thing that sticks out most when it comes to Bamimation is the cast, or rather, the cast members that are missing from this pilot episode. Now, details surrounding Bamimation are few and far between, but from what I can tell, it was most likely produced in the later part of 2006. The reason I say that is, Don Vito was absent from the episode, I'm guessing due to his arrest that took place in August of 2006. Chris Rabb wasn't in this either, as after Viva La Bam wrapped, he cut ties with pretty much everyone due to a falling out with Bam. And as for Tim Glom, well, I don't really know what he was doing. He was probably kicking back in a tree in the Louisiana Bayou, because he wasn't in this either. The episode starts out with a very fitting theme song that was written and composed by Jimmy Pop of the Bloodhound Gang. Opinions on this episode are pretty divided, but I think we can all agree that this theme music rocks. Anyway, the episode begins with the Pennsylvania Skate Saw Massacre, in which Bam and Dunn are riding skateboards with chainsaws attached. And the referee of this event is Lendon, who I'm always surprised to see in this episode because he wasn't really a major player on Viva La Bam, but I feel like he fit in pretty well on this show. As far as introductions go, this was a pretty good setup for the episode, but easily the funniest part of this opening scene was Dunn's pants getting shredded off by a chainsaw. We're then introduced to Brandon DiCamillo who, much like on Viva La Bam, insists on wearing a pirate outfit. Seeing as he was essentially a cartoon character during his time on Viva La Bam, you would think that Deco had a blast during the making of Bamimation, but that couldn't be further from the truth. It's such a pain in the butt. I'm so glad. I hope it never happens. I don't ever want it to happen. It's that crazy. It's huh? that unfun. It's that unfun. 
And it makes total sense because Deco's humor obviously works when it's scripted. I mean, he was hilarious and haggard. But we're talking about a show that was both scripted and confined to the television content rating system. So I can see why he didn't have the best time during the making of this pilot. Bam then gets his hands on a shrink ray invented by Rake Yon and goes on a shrinking spree, setting off the story for the rest of the episode. Rake is too busy preparing for a date with Scabriella to reverse the damage that's been done, so Bam decides to pull a magic school bus by shrinking down his Hummer and driving into Rake's rectum. And can we just talk about Rake for a second? I know that it was all done in the name of comedy, but they really did him dirty in this episode. He lives in a log cabin that looks like it belongs in the movie Deliverance. His teeth are absolutely horrendous, and he found the love of his life in a dumpster. But I'm not gonna lie, I laugh every time I look at those chompers. Bam and Dunn wreak havoc inside Rake's body while he's on a date with Scabriella at what looks to be a cartoon version of Antonio's from Viva La Bam, and the shrink ray is broken as a result, causing everything that was shrunk to reverse back to normal. And that's basically a condensed retelling of Bamimation. Like I said, opinions on this pilot are pretty mixed. Some people love it, others despise it, and apparently MTV fell into the latter category because they chose not to pick it up. After the dust settled a little bit on the unaired pilot episode, it was released on good old MySpace by Joe Franz in 2008. It was then reposted to YouTube, where it's amassed about a half a million views ever since. Bam clearly had a working relationship with Paramount and MTV during that time, so I doubt this pilot would have been shopped around to any other networks, but I'm surprised that they didn't at least just give it a short run on MTV2 to test the waters. Although, knowing that Brandon DiCamillo didn't have a fun time making this episode, I'm glad that it wasn't picked up, because he most likely wouldn't have signed on for the full series, and his inclusion in the pilot just made it so much better. But that's all for today's episode. I hope you enjoyed it. I always have a good time revisiting this series and I probably have enough material for one more installment, so look forward to that sometime in the future. As always, no thank you for watching, and I hope I don't see you on the next one.